My family arrived here first in 1620. My ancestor signed the Mayflower Compact. This is the seat of American democracy, one man, one vote. The rest of the family came over in 1645. Maryland, with a land grant from King of England through Lord Baltimore, and helped establish much of the region there. They were naughty, yes. It was fashionable in the day to have slaves. In fact, it was illegal not to have slaves. My great-grandmother's first cousin was Mary Lincoln. So on one side, I have the emancipators. On the other side, I have the enslavers. So, a, a real American. And with that, there's a certain sense that you're raised as a wasp, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, which is that it is your duty to guide and direct everyone else's play. That at the end of the day, they're all visitors here. They're guests in a way. Um, they came through Ellis Island. They did whatever they did, but you were here first by manifest destiny and invitation, special invitation. People understood back then, through the French model, noblesse oblige, that if you have too many pissed off, hungry, desperate people, they're gonna get upset. And when they get upset, they're gonna come and take your toys. They're gonna come on your lawn and take a whiz on it. And worse. So you never let people get so bent out of shape. You always have safety valves. You have just, just enough um, public services so that the pressure cooker doesn't explode. You know, my father liked to drink. Not go to the pub and knock back a pint, but basically buy cases of vodka. He was a real alcoholic, like the real deal. Having grown up with this excessive father and a mother who, in some of her better days, was a cross between Cruella DeVille and Mommy Dearest. No more You know, it was difficult, it really was. At around the age of 14, I was sent off to boarding school in Switzerland. Four years of Teutonic hell. My father had identified a school where former SS officers were living now in a neutral country. They were in their 80s at that time. You've seen these in the World War II movies, the guys dressed in white with the machine guns on the German side. It was, yeah, one of those fellas taught us how to ski. The house mother was Mussolini's former girlfriend, Fräulein Ragazzini. And I knew, just as most people have a general sense of right, wrong, and to what degree. We all do. We may ignore it, we may hit the override button, but we have a general sense of right, wrong, and to what degree. And I knew this was fucked up. He liked to collect German war memorabilia, if you catch my drift. Um, Schmeisser MP40 sub-automatic machine guns. A massive swastika that covered the entire wall of his den. Which, by the way, is illegal in a lot of countries. But not here. Still not here. It's just a collection. Right? It's just a museum. It doesn't mean anything. Really. So, he found from a movie set, I think it was the movie A Bridge Too Far, a bridge too where they far. used real panzer tanks. So he bought a panzer tank and decided to take it out one day for a drive. Now, most cities have ordinances for vehicles, where you can park them on the lawn, which lane, there isn't one for a Panzer tank. He took it as close as he could to what we called uptown, the village part. You know, roaring over people's lawns, tearing up flower beds. It's a tank. I mean, how do you drive a tank when you don't know how to drive a tank? You know, joysticks. And he got up behind this woman in a Mercedes and just swung the turret around right into her front windshield. They took away his tank. Um, they had problem towing it. Whether he use a local snow plow, I mean, it was, it was tough. So he lost his tank. And you couldn't insure it 
because it was a German panzer tank from World War II. So he had to write that off as a loss. He was very upset. He continued to drink, and he lived probably five years beyond what the physicians who attended him at the end had ever witnessed a human being live through with alcoholism. So he's in a wheelchair, snow white hair, dying of old age at 52. He was so massively deranged and so into his collections and guns and militia groups. My grandfather had died around this era. My grandfather was a, a civic leader and a good guy, and my grandfather died with a, a nice little fortune um, of bunches and bunches of millions of dollars, and donated 100% of it to charity. Didn't leave a penny for my father, because my grandfather knew that my father would build these massive militia groups, so he was left with nothing. I got a call that he was in the hospital, and it was the last throes. And he'd been in the hospital for three weeks when your liver is failing, all your organs are shutting down, and my step monster would go in there with little airplane bottles of vodka, sneak them in, and just pour them down his throat. And so she pretty much finished him off. Um, he wanted them. He wanted them. It's not as though he didn't. Um, but he died literally drunk. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So sorry. So sorry. Please accept my apology. First, Steve Paulson talks with Kerry Sudler, a man who discovered his family once owned slaves. He took a tape recorder back to his hometown in Maryland and found much more than he bargained for. I'm going to go out and uh, do a little uh, historical junket, a little family trip, going back to Sledmore, the plantation that my family had in 1713 when the house was built. Traditionally back then, the slave took the name of the the master. So if you look through a phone book or Google, you're going to find out that really anybody who has your last name, especially if it's an unusual last name, they're all going to have come from there, especially in Baltimore and surrounding areas. So I ended up putting this entire audio voyage together and uh, played it to a friend of mine with NPR and it ended up running as a national piece, 20 minutes long by the way. You deliberately set out to apologize to some of the, uh, the black descendants of, of your family slaves. Yeah, I couldn't find any record and I don't know of any instance where my family has ever officially or formally or informally apologized to any of these people. I was scared. I have to admit that I didn't know what was gonna happen. We have another bit of tape and I, I think this is a, a response of a black settler you met in a store near your old family plantation. Your white skin gives you access to almost anything that you want. I'm followed in grocery stores and I'm followed in department stores still. Is it better? Yeah, it's better in my own lifetime. It's better, but it's not perfect. It hasn't improved. And white people still say, yeah, I have black friends. And they say that I'm not racist. But if you have to make that statement, then there must be some racism somewhere. I certainly am racist still. I still have to work past all of that stuff because there's jealousy, envy, and sometimes hate. When I look at the things that other people have access to that I don't have. We do follow our programming. And so much of, of our journey, I think, is to disrupt the programming that no longer serves us well. 